What's going on everybody? It's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com and in this video I'm going to tackle versioning events, my guidelines on how to deal with versioning events. So if you're using an event-driven architecture or event sourcing, these are my guidelines. <laughs> All right, so the first guideline for versioning is don't version, meaning if you can be backwards compatible, uh, then do so. And most oftentimes, I think you probably can. So I'll give just an example of this is, let's say, let's create an event here and we'll give it um, a type, which we'll call inventory adjusted. This is kind of the event that I'll use, um, I guess throughout kind of this video and that I'm using in the blog post. So as I mentioned in my previous post, which I'll have a link in the description about naming and how to deal with that, um, check that out. So in this particular case, what I'm gonna do is we'll just call, we have our, our event uh, for inventory adjusted and let's say we got a SKU, which is called ABC123. And let's say that the, um, we also keep the quantity, let's say it's 10. Okay, so we have this um, event, inventory adjusted, um, that's the type. The event data is we have the SKU and the quantity. Now the thing is, is if we are trying to be backwards compatible, really what that means is we can add properties. We can add additional data to this event we just can't remove anything. So that means that we, like, I can't remove any of these properties, nor can I change the type of them, of the of the of what the value is. I can't all of a sudden change um, quantity to be some string that contains characters. That's not gonna work, right? Because the consumers are expecting this um, contract. This is our event contract. But there's nothing stopping me from adding additional properties and then with through whatever means to kind of document that, provide what those uh, additional properties are. Now, my uh, kind of example of this is if you think about a relational database and you think about adding a column, if we translate that to adding a property on an event, it's kind of the same idea, right? Is that there's nothing stopping you from adding a property and making that value null from the get-go. So that's essentially what consumers will think of it as. Because they won't be deserializing or realizing that property is there, they're just never gonna consume it, right? They're just never gonna do anything with any new property that you add. Um, so as long as, again, you're not changing it, feel free to add properties. Um, the caveat here is that if you're using event sourcing and you're using um, these events for um, like going backwards in time, as long as you can upcast this, if you're only gonna pay attention to uh, the inventory adjusted in a new particular way, that means if you have these properties that don't exist in your data store um, in these old versions, it's kind of like having that null value. How do you wanna deal with it? So again, just be backwards compatible. You can upcast, that's fine. If your consumers don't care about those new properties, they don't. All right, the second kind of way to deal with this is actually including a version number alongside your actual event data. So what that may look like is we literally consider uh, add a version here, which could be something along the lines of 1.0.0, right? Now, <clears throat> this is our initial version. If we want to be um, backward compatible still, we can still do that and increase our version number. Um, so let's say, well, let's do this to 1.0.1 .1, and we add something like a, um, reason code and maybe the reason code is some like constant string here let's call this damage right some product was damaged that's why we have an inventory adjustment this is still backward compatible we didn't change any of the schema we just added something new so existing clients can still use this um, but if we use semantic versioning here um, we kind of apply the same guidelines we can include our version number and change it as follows so this was 1.01, .01, and let's say now we want to deal with something uh, that's completely going to be a breaking change. So let's bump this to 2.0.0. And instead, what we want to do is instead of our event being um, just this individual skew with 
kind of a quantity and a reason code. Let's say we wanted to do, we wanted to include a, a collection of adjustments, like an array of adjustments. So now I'm going to have the quantity and reason code. Um, and we can do this multiple times, right? So let's do, let's say this one is, uh, we'll just call it lost, I guess, maybe. Oops. Let's say that we have five that we've lost. Right, so we've changed the contract. It's not backward compatible anymore. We have this individual SKU, and during that like product count, whatever was happening, we have multiple adjustments that we're making at one time. There was 10 damage products, and it, there's five products that we know we no longer have, which are lost. So again, you can use semantic versioning, include the version number to dictate kind of what the payload of the event um, looks like so that your uh, consuming clients can know which one and how to use it appropriately. So another option here is just to simply create a new type of event. Now this can often be because you realize that as you kind of get some more insights into the domain you're dealing with and the process, that it may be what you initially thought was the event um, kind of changed over time or again, changed through insights. So let's say, for example, this was our inventory adjusted, but that really wasn't the event. Some of the things that we wanted to do were explicitly call out like damaged product. And that is something that's an event when a product gets damaged itself. So then the question becomes, okay, if you have a new version, do you want to publish both events? Do you want to publish the old event and the new event? Um, if they're different events or, or even if they're versioned, do you want to double publish? Meaning you're going to publish both of the events at the same time. Um, the issue here is that you, your clients need to understand that you are publishing both of them and that they only likely want to process one of them. Now, this isn't that uncommon. It's, it's pretty normal when we're talking about in distributed systems um, and events for this to happen. You will double publish. And your consumers at that point, likely if they know that you have a new event that is replacing an existing event, they'll only consume one of them, right? They'll only deal and handle one of those events. However, if you're dealing with event sourcing, this becomes something that you probably do not want to do is double publish. And the reason is, is when you're rebuilding state um, based off these events, to have to deal with, oh, this event occurred and, this, and you have them back to back and you're only going to want to um, apply one of them to, to a projection isn't likely something you want to deal with. So double publishing, more likely in case where you're not using event sourcing, you're just publishing these out for outside consumers. If you're using event sourcing, you probably don't want to be double publishing that to your event stream that you're using to rebuild state. This video is a part of a blog series that I have related to message properties. So I've covered uh, defining message type and naming. This video is obviously my kind of guidelines for uh, versioning. So either keep everything backward compatible, don't version. If you have to version, think about something like uh, including the version number and semantic versioning. Uh, lastly, just create an entirely new event with a different type and name that represents a completely different concept. And be aware of if you're going to double publish, whether you're using that in event sourcing or not. So I'll include the uh, blog in the description, uh, which covers everything I'm talking about today, as well as the overall message properties blog posts and the videos that accompany those as well. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and please subscribe for more software architecture related videos.